sing together. Let's worship his name. And let's declare, do you see what I see?
that they are true. And I pray, God, that we would jump in, that we would trust you, that we would believe in you, that we would declare we know your promises are true. Therefore, I drop everything else to follow you. I trust in your faithfulness today, God. I know that you have come through before and I know that you will come through again. I've witnessed your faithfulness and I know you will always be faithful. God, keep our eyes focused on you. Keep our hearts focused on you today. This week, God, I pray that you would guide our steps. Help us to tell the city, to tell the nations, to tell our family what we have witnessed. We thank you that each and every one of us has their own story, their own testimony, and I pray, God, that we would use that, that we would simply tell our story because it's important because that's what changes lives for people to see other transformation. I pray, God, that you would give us boldness, that you would give us faith, you would give us determination to tell our story, to be a witness for you. God, you have called us to that. I pray that we would be faithful in return to do that for you and tell the people how you have changed us, have you, how you have given us resurrection power how we can stand here and worship your faithfulness regardless of the ups and downs of life. We can stand here and know that you are still faithful and worship you because you're still faithful. We praise your name in this place and we thank you for our prom your promises. God, keep our feelings and keep what we see out of the way and keep us focused on you, your path and your will. And it's in Jesus' name the church says, Come on and praise him for his promises today, church. Do you believe that your God is faithful today, church? Come on, sometimes you got to tell your brain until you believe it, and that's, that's okay, too. Sometimes you got to hold on for dear life. God knows. God's already a step ahead of you. He knows your pain. He knows your burdens. He knows your story, and he knows that he can turn it around so that you can be a witness for him. Hey, you could grab a seat. We're so glad you're here today at Movement Church came to get your Jesus on for the week, to get pumped up. That's what the church is. Come gather with us, get ready for the week, and then go be the hands and feet of Jesus all day, every day. And we're excited to be a part of that transformation and that walk with you. To tell you what's coming up, like our ladies event happening next Friday night, and I serve stuff coming up, you can check out this video right here for more info. Hey, Movement Church, we are so glad that you're joining us today. If it's your first week with us, we want to say welcome, and we hope that you feel right at home. And if you haven't downloaded the Movement Church app, head on to the App Store and take advantage of this great tool. We want to shout out the amazing volunteers that we have here at Movement Church. We want to thank the Children's Ministry for an awesome weekend last weekend. Woo -woo! We want to thank the nursery, to the preschool, to the elementary school volunteers. You guys just went above and beyond. Yes, from special bags, crafts, snacks, so many special things. And of course, the Easter Mystery Adventure. You guys all went above and beyond. Thank you all for so much you put in into making this Easter so special for the kids. That's right. So if you think it's your time to start serving like these incredible people, then now's the chance. You can get started on the app and click Start Serving, and we'll work with you to find the perfect place that you will love. Don't forget, ladies, that next week, Friday on April 19th is our women's event. It's just 12 days away of community, meeting new friends, worship, prayer, and growing together. Just invite a couple of girlfriends and come and enjoy yourself. We're so excited for Refresh. And now with that, let's keep today going and flow into today's message with Pastor Bill. Welcome to church today. You guys seem so far away. Far away. Anyways, our, as our young people are going off to their class, I just want to welcome you. And why don't you turn around and greet somebody near you and welcome them today as well on this special, special day. Well, I'm Pastor Bill, and I'm so glad to meet you. And if I haven't met you in person, I'd love to do so after church. So I, I hope we cross paths outside no need to run off like it's a fire drill after church. Um, you know, you could hang around for a few minutes. 
Um, I want to encourage you with your giving too because there's multiple ways to give. You can give on the app. You can give through the website. Most people are giving electronically. Probably 90 plus percent of our giving comes electronically. But you can always give with cash or a check. You can use envelopes. They're in the boxes on the back as you uh, exit today. So um, please take advantage of that. Well, we're going to, I'm starting a new series today called Be Happy. And I was thinking about the best example that I could tell you of somebody who is happy and someone who's not. I, I think about it like on Christmas morning, you've got this little boy who unwraps his Christmas present and sees the PlayStation box. That's the picture of happiness until he opens it and it actually contains the socks you got him and then that changes his whole countenance. Uh, be happy. I mean, um, you know, we can be happy here because the solar eclipse is not really going to affect us. I asked the light guy, could you black out the entire room so we could feel what a solar eclipse feels like and then put it, the lights back on in about four minutes? But that's a little more complicated than, than you would think, so, so we're not actually doing that. But uh, yeah, big solar eclipse day. Um, because you're here today, obviously you haven't flown to the part of the country that's actually going to experience a solar eclipse. But the good news is that I think it's, what, 2044, something like that, we'll experience it again, or you'll experience it again uh, in about 20 years or so. I remember as the kid, though, actually experienced a solar eclipse. I remember being outside, and then, you know, it was dark for a little bit, and then you know, God's lights came back on. It is kind of cool. I'm not sure it's worth taking a trip to the other side of the country, but anyways. I think being happy may be the number one goal, desire, dream, ambition, and prayer for people everywhere. This is not just a modern self-obsession that we are experiencing. And I know sometimes our pursuit of that is a little bit misdirected, because people are searching for happiness, sometimes in all the wrong places, but I believe happiness is something that God wants for us and happiness is something that is actually recognized in the Bible. Your desire for happiness was purposely put inside you by your creator. And if this longing was strategically placed within you, then I believe God must have a way for you to experience it. Our culture is always saying, you deserve to be happy. Society says, you've earned the right to be happy. Our friends say, whatever you decide to do, just make sure you're happy. Social media says, you deserve to be happy. You deserve to live a life you were excited about. Don't let others make you forget that. But we're not really happy people. We're experiencing more stress, more sadness, more anger, more physical pain, more worry than maybe any other time in history. Yet God says, I'm passionate about your happiness. I don't think you would know it by looking at the many church uh, Kermuggins that, uh, you know, that fill churches, people with the saddest faces. If you showed up at any church today across the country and probably around the world, you probably wouldn't believe that God wants us to be happy. We might believe it up here, but it hasn't shown here on our faces. I don't know if you've ever thought about God being happy. You know, we all have these pictures of God in our mind, right? What does God look like in your mind? It's like the pictures we've seen of Jesus. We've seen pictures of Jesus at the Last Supper. Now, obviously, Peter wasn't there taking a selfie. You know, this is just what people imagine, but nobody seems to be happy. You know, what is your favorite image of God? Is your favorite image of God that he's actually happy? What if our image of God was that God was just 
bursting forth with laughter with a huge smile on his face. I mean, I just have to believe that Jesus was a fun guy, that Jesus was a happy guy. I mean, think about some of the stories that Jesus told and tell me, no, he's not a happy guy. Now, if God is a happy God, do you not think that he intends for us to be happy? And I'm saying that I believe the church today needs to reclaim happiness and do so without shame, without embarrassment, we probably could use a, 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 a redefinition of happiness in biblical terms, but it's something Christians need to be called to and we need to help Christians to grow in. And what Christians often do is we swing the pendulum to one side or the other. And because so much of our world might be seeking happiness in perverse ways, we've decided that it's not for us to be happy. We've even gone so far to say that, look, the Bible chooses to use the word rejoice and, and joy, and joy and happiness are not the same thing. Happiness is what non-Christians experience, but boy, those of us who are in Christ, we experience joy. That's really not true. Happiness, blessed, joy, these are all synonyms. You realize that the Sermon on the Mount that we cite as blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are, the, the word's actually happy. The, the word's actually happy. It could be blessed, it could be happy, it could be joyful, are, but we, we gotta quit downplaying the whole idea of happiness, despising happiness. But happiness is something we as the church need to strive for. A.W. Tozer said it like this, the people of God ought to be the happiest people in all the wide world. People should be coming to us constantly and asking the source of our joy and delight. But I'm not so sure that's what people who are not in Christ are asking those of us who are in Christ. I mean, how many people have come up to you and, and said something like this to you? You're just like the happiest person that I know. You're just filled with joy. Tell me about how to get that. But that's what I think people ought to be saying to us. Pastor, author, preacher John Piper says, you can't stop wanting to be happy. God has wired you to be happy. That's not a sinful thing, that's a good thing. It's not wrong to have a desire to be happy. Now, it could be wrong in how we pursue that happiness, but it's not wrong to be happy. Last month, the 2024 World Happiness Report was released. Can you guess what country was crowned the world's happiest country? Obviously, somebody like Janet has read the article. Finland was ranked as the happiest, having the happiest people on the planet, and they've been the happiest for seven years running. There's something about those northern countries because it's Finland, it's Denmark, it's Iceland, and then Sweden that is the top four. Snow and cold must have something to do with it, I guess. We think because we live in this warmer climate that that makes us happier, apparently not. But the United States has dropped out of the top 20 for the first time ever. The U.S. is now 23 on the list. 23. And when adjusted for age, a concerning statistic emerges. The U.S. ranks number 10 for those people over the age of 60. But for those under the age of 30, the U.S. doesn't even rank in the top 50. We are ranked number 62. for young people and their happiness. 
And it's the low score of young people that drove the overall number down and pushed us out of the top 20. Now what's strange about this is that in the past, happiness was greatest amongst the young people, pushing us upwards, but that's not the case anymore. The US Surgeon General says, that young people are experiencing the equivalent of a midlife crisis, he says. Why are young people so unhappy? Well, many people automatically go to what happened in 2020 with the whole COVID-19 thing. It would be easy to blame it on COVID-19. That might have somewhat of an effect on it. But take that and add to that the fact that young people face a different and a steeper climb to prosperity than previous generations. With the rising costs of things and an unstable job market. And then add to that their fear of weather and climate disasters. The kinds of things that seem to be happening in a, a greater frequency and with greater intensity. Those kinds of things paint a bleak future for people. And then there are the global conflicts raging around the world and this ever-increasing polarization of the political environment. Further reasons for our unhappiness. But the reason I say we can't blame it all on COVID-19 is because happiness has been decreasing for all age groups since 2006 to 2010, particularly amongst young people. And that was before COVID-19. That was before all the climate change issues that are thrown out there. That was long before Donald Trump ever became president but instead a different series of events occurred. Facebook opened itself to the public in 2006, and Apple began selling the iPhone in 2007. By 2011, a majority of Americans were now on Facebook, and by 2013, most Americans were using smartphones and the internet. The drop in happiness and what I just described is no mere coincidence. Happiness is falling due to the rise of social media. We can talk about a solar eclipse this week, but I think what's more serious is the social eclipse that has been, having, been happening for quite a while. While it offers a form of connection, Social media is fueling inadequacy and social comparison. In a 2022 study, it was found, a, a, a strong correlation was found between an increased use of social media and symptoms like depression and loneliness in young adults. And that's not only the case for us here in America, but it is a global trend. Despite online connections, young people are experiencing a lack of strong in-person relationships, and there's a lot of factors for that. There, there, there's, there's like, Geographically, people are kind of moving around and, and not staying in a particular place for that long. There's, there's, there's that geographical mobility. There are these social anxieties that people have. But can I tell you that the happiest people on earth are those who have solid relationships and friendships? When asked, what is the opposite of social media, someone rightly responded, social life. Most of us might be on social media, but not all of us have a social life. And so all these years of social media, 
We have been conditioned to believe that friendship is as simple as hitting a button and sending a friend request. But such friendship doesn't really provide the kind of companionship and fellowship that we're craving. I mean, I'm, I'm not down completely on social media. I think, I think there are, are good things and there's bad things about it, but I was thinking, what name do you go by on social media? Wouldn't it be interesting if you tried changing your name to nobody? Because then when all of your friends are posting what they had for dinner last night, you can click that you like it and it'll show up that nobody likes it. I think that would be kind of fun. Because nobody really cares what you had for dinner last night. Do you know what social, uh, what, what my social network was as a kid? One word, outside. That was our social network before Facebook and social media, outside. Your parents just sent you outside until it was bedtime. <laughs> Apparently parents didn't really want to spend time with their kids. Get outside. I just came home from school. Get outside. I'm thirsty. Get outside and drink out of the hose. I'm hungry. Eat whatever you got left from your lunch. But I don't know if you know this, but good friends are good for your health. Literally, good friends are good for your health. Adults with strong social connections have a reduced risk of many significant problems, including depression, high blood pressure, and an unhealthy body mass index. Friends can help you cultivate good times. They can provide support for you during bad times. Friends prevent isolation and loneliness and, and, and give you a chance uh, to, to offer needed companionship for you. Friends have a way of increasing your sense of belonging and purpose. They have a way of boosting your happiness, of reducing your stress, improving your self-confidence and self-worth, help you to cope with traumas such as divorce, serious illness, job loss, or death of a loved one. They have a way of encouraging you to change or avoid unhealthy lifestyles. In fact, studies have found that older adults who have meaningful relationships and social support are likely to live longer than their peers with fewer connections. So it makes sense that we start prioritizing happiness. And to remember that true happiness doesn't come from money, from looks, or fame, true happiness comes from meaningful human relationships. And though that's been understated and unappreciated, friendship is the single most important factor in determining a person's happiness. Thus the reason I'm starting with that in this series. It's the single most important factor in determining your happiness. Developing and maintaining good friendships takes effort, takes work. But the enjoyment and the comfort that friendships can provide makes that investment worthwhile. Now, our Surgeon General warns parents that young people are really suffering, and he stresses that allowing children to use social media is like giving them a drug that's not been proven safe. Dr. Murthy says that American teenagers, this might be shocking to those of you who don't have a teenager in the home, 
But American teenagers spend nearly five hours a day on social media on average. And a third of them stay up until midnight on weeknights on their devices. Among teens, he says, who are heavy users of social media, that's five plus hours a day, they are twice as likely to be depressed as non-users. According to Purdue University, social media is harmful to the well-being, to our well-being, causing unhappiness because one, it creates anxiety to, due to the fear of missing out. That's FOMO, fear of missing out. That's why kids are constantly on, fear they'll miss out on something. Number two, it triggers negative feelings because of comparison. A person might take 30 selfies and then only post one and trash the other 29 to get the very best that they could possibly present to the world as if that was their life. Just like you posting that unbelievable meal you made, trying to convince us that that's what you do every day. But we know better. We know better. Number three, it creates unrealistic standards of beauty and success, thereby lowering one's sense of self-worth and esteem. My kids are grown, so there's not much I can do about it now, but those of you who are parents that still have kids at home, I I just have a, a few thoughts for you. You can take it or leave it. One, Put off kids getting social media accounts as long as you possibly can. Number two, when they do get a social media account, limit the amount of time that they spend on it to an hour or less a day using parental controls. Number three, try to teach them that social media is not an accurate reflection of people's lives. Number four, encourage exercise and offline interests. Number five, as a parent, you set a good example of how to use tech. And number six, help your kids to make real friends. This is a part of what's gro- what growing up's about, right? That's, a, that's, a part, that's something that we all were supposed to have learned when we were kids, how to make friends. But dare I say that America has a new epidemic. It can't be treated using traditional therapies even though it can be debilitating and have deadly consequences, but that epidemic is loneliness. We are a people starved for friendship. We chuckled when we watched Tom Hanks in the 2000 movie called Castaway. As Tom Hanks played that FedEx employee named Chuck Nolan, whose cargo plane crashed, leaving him marooned on an island all alone. And over the years, we saw loneliness getting the better of him, and he became so starved for companionship that he started talking to a volleyball named what? Some of you are answering that, and you weren't even born yet. Wilson, a volleyball, as if it were another human being and friend. But you see, loneliness, it can take a huge toll on us. As Americans, we're lonely people and it is affecting us and it is detrimental to our mental health, to our physical health. And experts say it leads, it increases our risk of heart disease, of dementia, 
of stroke and premature death. Loneliness won't just make you miserable, but it may in fact kill you. And that's why we've got to do something about it. A 2020 Harvard study uh, showed that 61% of adults from 18 to 25 reported feeling serious loneliness. But it was 48% across the general population. So that means if you're feeling lonely today, you're not alone in that. Because one in two adults in the U.S. are living with measurable levels of loneliness. Turn and look at the person next to you. One of you is living with a significant level of loneliness. More people are struggling with loneliness than they are diabetes. Did you know that social isolation and loneliness has the same effects on your body as smoking 15 cigarettes a day? Over the past few years, several studies have suggested that social isolation and loneliness poses a bigger risk to us as a people than does smoking or obesity. And like I said, studies are showing that those who have fewer friends will die sooner. Now, I thought it was quite interesting that the UK, the United Kingdom, in 2018 appointed a new cabinet officer called the Minister of Loneliness. I didn't get into seeing what he or she does, but apparently they're trying to do something about the epidemic. When you appoint a cabinet position called the Minister of Loneliness, you recognize that it is a huge problem. But as our Surgeon General says, building social connections in our life has to be a vital priority. It's something that we have to be intentional about. And I know it's tough with the transient nature of us in this country. I know it's tough with people who who work from home. It's tough even though we're surrounded with lots of people and we have lots of followers or lots of friends or connections on social media. Those aren't typically people who show up when your life is in crisis. But I want you to know that friendship is a wildly underrated but necessary medication. Think of it as medication. Now somebody said there's nothing better than a friend unless it's a friend with chocolate to which we would probably all say yes, that's true. But here's how I want you to think about this whole picture from a theological standpoint. You understand that God is a relational God. When we talk about the Trinity, when we, we'll talk about God the Father, we'll talk about God the Son, we'll talk about God the Holy Spirit. God is a relational being. And then we also know we have been created in his image, which would then make us relational beings as well. You might remember this from Genesis chapter 2.18 Then the Lord God said, this is interesting because this relational God said that it wasn't enough for this one he had created in his image just to have a connection with him, but he said, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. God hates loneliness. But I want to point out something to you about this that you might not have ever really thought about before. Because when God recognized that something there was not good, it was a still perfect world when he said that. 
He said that before Adam had ever sinned. He said that before sin even entered into the picture. When he says it, that it's good, it's not good that a person be alone, he's stressing the importance of human connections in his eyes. And since this loneliness predates sin, it should point out to us that there's a cure for us right now. We don't have to wait to get to heaven to experience this cure. Tim Keller, who was a pastor in New York City, passed away last year, once said, loneliness is the only ache on earth you can experience that did not come from sin. Every other ache you'll feel can be pointed back to sin in some way, but not loneliness. It was there before Adam was imperfect. While he was perfect in creation, he felt lonely, and so God invented friendship. God gave relationship to us as humans. And if we disconnect ourselves from those things, there's going to be a price that we'll pay just like being disconnected from God leaves us spiritually dead. There's a price to pay for being friendless, for being lonely, and for being isolated. Friends are essential for a life of happiness. You'll never experience happiness without friends. It's essential. I mean, think about what friends do. Friends add value to our lives. First of all, friends bring a multiplied impact. Like if you're just trying to go it alone, your productivity is quite limited. But add a friend to the equation and all of a sudden one plus one equals three or maybe even more. Because as you've heard before, teamwork makes the dream work. And this is how I think Paul the Apostle was able to accomplish so much. It's through his interconnections, his interpersonal relationships, through his friendships. Good friends bring life support. The question, the question isn't, will we fall down in life? The question is, who will be there to help us up? You might remember the story in the Bible of the paralyzed man who had four special friends who were his lifeline. And when they heard that Jesus was there, they provided life support for him, taking their friend to Jesus, even cutting a hole in the roof in order to drop their friend to be right there in front of Jesus. That's, that's what friends do. Good friends have got our back. We're in the midst of a spiritual war and Satan doesn't fight fair and people don't fight fair either. So we need people who can defend us from time to time. We need that someone or those someones who have our back when we're getting bloodied from behind that they can save us to fight another day. And when you have a friend like this, this is a friend who will defend you against gossip, against betrayal, against misrepresentation, or any number of attacks from your blind side. Now that phrase blind side became more popular with a film that came out some years ago. And the film was about a football player who played left tackle because if you are a right-handed quarterback and you've got the ball and the field's that way and your back is toward the left side of your line, that left tackle is the guy who's gonna save your life. We all need some left tackles in our life. Good friends help the formation, help our formation. Good friends help to change who we are. When I was in junior high, I had braces, like so many of you probably did too. 
Braces are kind of an interesting thing when you're not the one wearing them. But braces have this unbelievable way of fixing crooked teeth. The whole theory of braces is time under tension. That's the whole theory of braces, time under tension. Your teeth need tension for a certain period of time. And getting that tension or that push, if you will, over time is enough to fix your smile and straighten your teeth. Friends are like that too. Friends are time under tension as well. Sometimes it's friends speaking to you, speaking into you. As Proverbs 13 says, it's like iron sharpening iron. So a person sharpens the countenance of their friend. But in a world of social media, I I want you to at least get this today. A real life, in-person friend is worth a thousand followers on social media. Nobody really cares how many followers or friends you have on social media because they're not real. The Bible says that a true friend shows love no matter what. A true friend can give heartfelt advice, bringing joy to the heart. A true friend can rebuke when necessary, but the correction is always done in love. A true friend influences, enlivens, encourages, and sharpens. A a true friend avoids gossip, forgives, and does not hold a grudge. A true friend is loyal. A true friend helps in time of need. And Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 4, a man who has spent his life seeking after happiness in all the wrong places, seeking it from money, from fame, from sex, from parties. And and this is what Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 4, starting in verse 9. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. So a true friend can help you get up. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A true friend can help you warm up. Verse 12, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer three or even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. A friend can help you stand up as well. Now all this happening in our culture should not come as a shock to us. If you're a person who's read anything about Bible prophecy or you're someone who likes to read about how things will be in the end times, a key distinction of the end times is the disappearance of the loyalty of friends. The Bible says that people will not only turn away from the faith, but they will betray and hate each other. This is just another reason for us to seek to build human connections, to build social connections in our lives. Another reason why this has to be a vital priority. But sadly, some of the people who need this the most avoid situations that could help bring the cure for their problems. People who struggle with loneliness oftentimes can't pull themselves together to to get in an atmosphere where they can even make friends. And so they become even more alienated and they become convinced that they're the only lonely one. 
It's like the story of the man who laid by, by the pool, this handicapped man. You remember this story laying by, by a pool and then Jesus comes by and Jesus offers him a miracle, but this man is so discouraged, this man is so lonely and depleted that he doesn't even notice his opportunity and simply responds, I don't have any friends to put me in the water. Lonely and alone. Social, social isolation and loneliness can do that to a person. But I'm here to tell you that God has a plan. That plan for friendship probably does not include social media. Again, I'm not telling you to get off of social media. That, that's not my whole point here. I'm just saying that social media creates an illusion of friendship. But God's plan includes you and I being real friends, having real friends. And if we're gonna have friends, then we're going to have to do something. You can't blame this on everybody else. You can't put this off on me. I can't put this off on you. We can't blame people. Simply, we're gonna have to be friendly. I know that's just mind-boggling and an earth-shattering truth, to be friendly. Now, the King James translates Proverbs 18, 24 as a man who has friends must show himself friendly. Theologians would say that's probably not the best translation there, but you get the idea. If you want friends, why not show yourself friendly? Some of you might know who Gabrielle Reese is. She's now retired from women's beach volleyball. This goes back to the early 2000s as well. Gabrielle Reese is what Sean White was for men's snowboarding. And in a recent interview, she was asked, asked, what's something that's helped you out in life that maybe other people would need to hear? And she said, and I quote, I've just decided to be the one to go first. I've just decided to be the one to go first. The person conducting the interview asked her what she meant by that, and she said, well, by that I mean if I'm checking out at the store, I'll say hello first. If I come across somebody and make eye contact, I'll smile first. She said the realization is people are ready, but everyone's kind of just waiting for someone to go first because we're being trained in this world to opt out. She said nobody's going first anymore. So what if we all decided, as of right now, I'm going to go first? What if we all decided that we were going to take the initiative? That we were going to be friendly? That we were going to go first? We're not going to wait for somebody else to notice us. Because if you want to have friends, you're going to have to be friendly. Now, certainly we can pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open up some doors for us to, to get these friends that we need in our life. Jesus was a relational being while here on earth. He had 70 preacher friends, if you will, that he sent out. There was a time when he appeared to 500 disciples after the resurrection. But we all know that Jesus had 12 close friends which was miraculous for a guy in his 30s. But Jesus had 12 close friends and three really best friends, Peter, James, and John. Well, what if we began to ask God to open us up for friendship, open us up to build deep friendships? Now, if you're going to have friends, you're going to have to go where other people have gathered. Studies show that Americans who attend church regularly 
have more friends than those who rarely, who attend rarely or not at all. So the good news is you're at church. And some of you have some really good friendships that you've developed here. And as one of the leaders, it's, it's fun to watch people develop these friendships and these relationships, but it's gonna take some work. Just showing up late to church and leaving before it's over is not gonna provide you with friends. Maybe you need to volunteer. When you look at the band that's up here, you know, there's a couple of teams that make up this band and they alternate weeks. These people get together on a regular basis and they have a lot of fun together. Get involved in a team, volunteer. Maybe the easiest thing to do and you could start today is just appoint yourself as one of our ushers. I'll appoint you all as ushers. You are all now ushers, greeters. You are all members of the hospitality team. And so now you have a service opportunity. Somebody told me the other day that Richard Braga is the reason they come to church here. Because on their second week, Richard knew their name and called them by name. He's got an amazing ability to do that. Well, look, you could, you could do that. You could join a life group. But we all need to be cheerful. We all need to put a smile on our face. We all ought to just relax and be comfortable. We all need to be a little more conversational, a little more inviting. We just need to go first. Now, I've, I've told you this before, and I'm not going to re, repeat this just for, as a, to get your sympathy, because this, this is not the purpose of me telling you this. But I think most pastors would probably agree that being a pastor is one of the loneliest jobs in the world. Because <laughs> oftentimes, uh, this is just my observation, people who aren't living right don't really want to be too connected to the pastor because I think people view the pastor as the Holy Spirit. You know, like the pastor knows what I'm doing when I'm not in church. <laughs> He knows what I'm thinking and he knows where I've been. He knows the kind of friends I have and no, I don't want him around. So I, I've known a particular pastor, Mark, who's the pastor of Victory Outreach in Moreno Valley. He and I have been in this town for over 20 years. And after, we used to have these pastor prayer meetings and then some pastors died and some retired and moved away and the only two left standing were myself and Mark. And we decided to do something not that spiritual and that would be just to meet at Starbucks and have coffee every other Wednesday morning. And during the Christmas holiday season, things got pretty hectic for both of us, and there was a couple of months that we, we didn't meet, and finally we, we rearranged our meeting time, and Mark came and he said, my wife Norma asked me, how come you don't meet with your counselor anymore? And I said, as funny as that sounds, Mark, I truly believe that as we meet together, these are mental health sessions for us both. You might feel like this in your own career path, but 
Nobody understands what you're going through. That's, nobody understands what I go through who's not a pastor. And, and maybe you feel that way with your career as well. Nobody really understands what life is like for you doing that. So he and I have been meeting and this last week, I met up with another pastor in town that I know who pastors a, ch a church down the street on the corner of Ironwood and Indian. His name is Jim. And he and I crossed paths on Tuesday and I said, hey, Jim, Mark and I meet for coffee on Wednesdays. Would you like to join us? I said, I just wanna be clear. There's nothing spiritual about this. We're not meeting together for prayer. You know, we're not leading a Bible study, we're not trying to disciple, we're just meeting for coffee. This is a mental health thing, really. And Jim said, sure. So we were at the Starbucks at uh, Hemlock, just east of Peacock, you know that one down there? <laughs> there are three pastors sitting at a table. Now, granted, we're not wearing clerical collars or anything like that. We're just sitting there laughing, having a good time when this guy walks up to the table and he mumbles something and we didn't understand what he said, so I asked him, say that again? And he said, do you guys have any cocaine? <laughs> okay, so... Obviously, we didn't. I said, we do have Jesus, but he wasn't interested. And he walked away, and I said, what do we look like? <laughs> I mean, how, how do people perceive the three of us sitting at this table drinking coffee that would ask us for cocaine? I said, Mark, you and I have been meeting here for well over a year. Nobody's ever asked us that, but Jim shows up, and now a guy walks up and says, do you guys have any cocaine? I'm looking at Jim going, dude. <laughs> it's things like that. I mean, as sad as that is, don't get me wrong. Um, we'll laugh about that for the rest of our lives. I don't know who your friends are. I don't know if you have any friends. If you're a guy, chances are you have fewer friends than the women in this room. But one of the things that I believe the Lord spoke to me about during those 40 days of trying to listen and hear from God, he gave me a word and that was one, one word. Give me more, but this one was the word connection. But it was with an X and not a T. I realized that, man, we've got to do a better job of helping people connect. And by that, I think, meaning connect as friends. And so there's a newer lady that's been coming. I can't see because it's dark out there if Tina Williams is here. But Tina said to me a few weeks ago, like on her second or third Sunday here, have you ever heard of something called Supper for Six? I said, yes, but tell me about that. She told me about that. And I said, I've heard of Supper for Six or Dinner for Eight. And it's basically that people sign up. And then they're put in these groups of six or eight, whatever is ultimately decided, and then one couple or one individual invites everybody else over for dinner one month, and then another person or couple the next month, and another person the next month. It's just an opportunity for people to connect with each other. Ah, oh, that'd be great. And I hope you'll see that as great too. We'll try to get that situated so you could sign up for that. You know all those meals that you post on Facebook that you make? <laughs> now is your chance to share it with four or six other people and see if they post what you made. That'll be the kicker right there, right? 
how can you get connected better? We poured a 5,000 square foot, uh, we, we poured a 2,500 square foot concrete patio out there for connection. For you to connect with other people, to talk, sit down. But I think we could all do better at being friends and I think that's something that God wants us to do and I think that will lead to a greater level of happiness. And those who are parents are gonna have to work really hard to help your kids connect with other people in real life situations. That, that is one of the good things about school. So kids are kind of in an environment where they have to kind of make friends but not live in a social media world. So as parents, you've got your work cut out for you. But just as adult people here in this room, we've got our work cut out for us to become better friends. And I just think if you practice, if I practice, if we practice Gabrielle Reese's line, go first, it might really make a difference. But I guess more important than just who your friends are on this earth, I wanna ask you, if you're friends with God. I think one of the most interesting scriptures in the entire Bible is when James in the New Testament records this, that Abraham believed God and he was called a friend of God. I wanna ask you, are you a friend of God? It goes back to what it said that Abraham believed. Are you a believer? If you're a believer, you are a friend of God. And when people ask you, hey, do you have friends? My best friend of all is God. I'm a friend of God. But beyond that here on this earth, living, breathing, human being friends, I am friends with, let's pray, Lord. In a world that becomes more and more isolated, in a world that is becoming more and more lonely, it is no wonder that our level of happiness is decreasing. I want to pray for us to first of all be friends of God. And anyone in this room or anyone watching online today that is not a believer, who has not committed their lives to you, oh God, they are not a friend of God yet, but they can be. And I pray that today they might go first and ask God to be their friend. I pray that you'll help us in this church context to be friendly with one another and to build friendships. And that our friends would go well past this place as well, Lord, but I pray we'll have a good number of friendships that can help our mental state, our physical state, our spiritual state. And I pray that we'll be the happiest people on the planet as A.W. Tozer said we should be. I pray that we can do our part of ending this social eclipse. And I pray that you'd help us with this even today before we get to our cars. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, look, if you'd like to pray with somebody before you go, just meet be a couple people up here in the front. Just meet with them. Tell them what you want them to pray about with you and get some prayer before you go. But look, if this is your first time here, um, I- I'd love to meet you. I'll-, I'll go outside there. I'll see you out there. I'd love for you to introduce yourself. I'd like to, to be your friend. Have a great afternoon.